it's, it's always nice to be here in the heart of all the Bitcoin development. There's so many projects that are going on here in the Bay Area. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. So as he said, I work at BitBay. Uh, I'm basically responsible for going out and talking to all of the various companies that uh, use uh, open source software and in particular BitPay's projects. Uh, I'm responsible for listening to them and figuring out what they're trying to build, what their plans are, and making sure that our open source strategy is aligned with a lot of the entrepreneurs and developers such as yourselves that are building projects. So in case you don't know a little bit about BitPay, um, we're a payment processor. We make it really easy for businesses to accept Bitcoin. We started in May of 2011. Uh, so we've been around for a while. We saw, you know, back then, Empty Docs was a, still a viable exchange. Um, unfortunately, you know, as time goes on, we learn a lot of lessons. And as, as such, we've had to build a lot of software that sort of supports our enterprise customers. You may have heard, for example, that Microsoft last year is now accepting Bitcoin for a lot of their digital goods. Microsoft has an entirely different breed of demands than, you know, your, your average customer, your mom and pop store at the, at the uh, end of the corner might so we've, we've spent a lot of time building open source software that is highly secure and, for our needs, highly modular. Um, different customers have different needs, so a lot of the things that we've built into this BitCore plugin um, are actually uh, very extensible. About a, it was about a year ago, actually, that uh, we announced this project, actually, here at this meetup. It was probably about maybe half the number of people that it is today. Um, and it was our first early draft at what BitCore was. BitCore is a JavaScript exclusive platform. Um, the reason we chose JavaScript is because JavaScript runs in more places than any other programming language ever, right? It runs in browsers, it runs on servers, it runs, every, it runs on mobile devices. And what we wanted was an isomorphic code base, right? We wanted to make sure that uh, once you wrote your code, you didn't have to change it multiple times. And so we wrote an isomorphic uh, set of code that would run highly performant in multiple places. So what we did is we realized that there would be a lot more uses for Bitcoin in the future uh, than simply currency. You're starting to see a lot of the, the development of these applications start to get, get a little bit more press. Um, payment channels are really interesting. Uh, Ethereum has been hitting the sphere lately in the compute space. Storage has been hitting the scene in terms of the storage space. So we really realized this early on. And we took, we took BitCore and we wanted to build some abstract classes that make it really easy to build some of these additional applications on top of them. Public key, private key, some basic crypto things. Script, in the case of uh, Bitcoin, when you want to validate a script and that might validate a transaction, or in some cases a data store. Uh, peer, uh, obviously because BitCore is a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, you want to be able to connect to those peers and represent those in abstract fashions. We've got many more classes that I'm not going to dive into detail of everything just tonight. Instead, I'm going to show you a sample of some of the more common things that you might want to do in an application. You can check out everything at bitcore.io. We have an amazing online playground where you can literally run the code right there in the browser without downloading a single package. Uh, bitcore.io slash playground. Uh, everything is fully documented with code examples at bitcore.io. Again, it's, uh, what was really important to us was test coverage. Um, Bitcoin is, you know, you, you want to be bug for bug compatible, right? Otherwise, you end up with a hard fork. This has happened a number of times in Bitcoin's history where, you know, a small change in the software has resulted in a divergent consensus. Um, we think about the CAP theorem, CAP, you know, you have, in any data system, you have consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Uh, what Bitcoin provides is consistency and availability, and eventual, eventual consistency, I should say, as well as partition tolerance through the consensus, net, consensus uh, resolution mechanism. What we did is we took all of Bitcoin Core, the, the actual uh, original Satoshi code, all of the fixtures, all of the tests for Bitcoin Core, and we, we set the, the minimum bar for bit, the new BitCore, once we decided to rewrite it, is it has to pass all of those core tests. And that has resulted in over 98% of our lines of code that we have in BitCore are covered by our tests. We have a number of additional tests that are on top of it, so it's very highly tested. This is very important for our enterprise-grade customers. Basic things in Bitcoin. 
constructing and broadcasting transactions. Uh, for those of you who are currently using the original uh, branches of Bitcoin or Bitcore 0.1, uh, this new Bitcore has started a refactor as of 0.8. It is now currently at 0.11, and I want to show you a little bit about what that API looks like. Uh, everything in Bitcore uh, is a namespaced class, right? For those of you familiar with Node.js, require just simply pulls in uh, an outside module. In this case, we'll pull in Bitcore. We'll subspace transaction. And we're just going to create a new instance of this transaction, right? Our goal here was ease of use. You'll notice that everything is very named as if it were for a human, right? You have dot from. You'll take a UTXO, an unspent transaction output. Uh, which is also a class you can instantiate in Bitcore. You can pull these from an Insight API. You can pull this from Bitcoin RPC. You could even create a way of tracking this in Bitcore if you would like. You pull in an unspent transaction. Uh, you specify a destination. And the second parameter for that is an amount. How much would you like to spend to that? You can then set the fee for that particular transaction. Um, very simply, provide a change address. If you do not provide a change address, you will actually end up spending all of the remainder of the, the balance in that transaction uh, to the miner. So do be conscious of this. You always want to specify a change address. And then, of course, uh, provide a signature, right? And you'll provide a private key object in this case uh, and sign that transaction. You, that transaction object now has all of the attributes that it needs to be encoded and broadcast on the Bitcoin network. So it, it's a little hard to see here, but this is a, a full real-world use case of that. Uh, we're pulling in an address, we're pulling in private keys, and we're pulling in the unspent output class. Um, you may not be able to see it, but the unspent output uh, accepts a transaction ID, um, an address, a script pub key, and an amount. You can pull this from the Bitcoin Bitcoin peer-to-peer uh, -peer network and literally pass it into the Bitcore transaction, uh, into the unspent output constructor, and then directly pass it into transactions. Once you have a transaction constructed like this in Bitcore, it's very easy to broadcast. Uh, you simply call the serialized method, and you get the hex-encoded version of that transaction, which you can then immediately pump into Bitcoin RPC to, to broadcast. Or as I'll show you in just a minute, you can actually broadcast that directly using Bitcore. So you'll see the long hex string here. You'll just copy-paste that into Bitcoin RPC. Totally a valid transaction. So. I talked a little bit about you know, connecting to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network uh, on its own. Uh, this is actually the beginning of our plug-in architecture, where Bitcore itself offers a very basic set of functionality. It offers that base set of classes, not much more. Right? We don't want to increase file size. We don't want to you know, slow the software down. So we've broken everything out into plugins, and I'll, I'll enumerate them in a moment. Uh, Bitcore PDP is going to be one that allows you to connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network. In this case, we're going to connect to a single node. Um, I'll be publishing these slides online. In fact, they're already open source on GitHub, so you can actually read through the examples. Um, but what you're seeing here is a peer constructor, uh, an event emitter, and I subscribe to specific uh, messages. In this case, I, uh, on an inv uh, inventory message, I can handle that message appropriately. On a transaction, if I want to listen for specific transactions and filter them, perform specific behaviors, it is a simple one-line function to do so. Um, and you simply say you want to connect to that network. Excuse me. So it's really this simple. It's just a couple lines of code to connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network. We've handled all of the underlying work behind the scenes. Uh, here's an example. You, a lot of times you want to connect to more than one peer, right? You, you don't want single points of failure in this case. So it also Bitcore P2P, the plugin, also exposes a pool class uh, where you can supply an array of peers to connect to, exactly like you would do with a single peer, uh, and, and also listen to and bind events to the individual peer messages that you receive. This functions exactly like Bitcoin RPC. When you receive a message that there is a new peer, the, Bit the peer discovery functions exactly like Bitcoin RPC. And you can write your own methods for managing those peer sets. What we do for now is we cap it at about, I think it's 128 peers is the limit, the upper limit. At that point, we'll just uh, sit with that. But you can completely override those behaviors. Uh, there's also a disconnect method, which allows you to disconnect from the pool. So the transaction that we created before 
you can simply broadcast a message to this pool or to a specific peer even uh, that, hey, here's a new transaction. And now, without ever touching Bitcoin RPC, that bloated behemoth that it is, right, you can now fully broadcast a transaction and literally have only ever touched a JavaScript. One of the more interesting things that uh, is, is sort of uh, becoming more and more popular today uh, is payment channels. Now, there's a number of ways of doing this, um, but we've chosen in Bitcore to implement a plugin called payment, uh, Bitcore Channel that implements this almost exactly the same protocol that Bitcoin J did, which is the first implementation. I believe uh, Mike Hearn and I believe Matt, you may have worked on that as well. Um, we basically replicated that. And a payment channel is a way of rolling up a, a high volume of small uh, value transactions into a single unit uh, and only broadcasting it onto the blockchain once. So we call these consumers and providers, a consumer being the one who would initiate the contract and say, hey, I'm going to use internet service through this router, or hey, I would like to pay for this API. And the provider is the uh, entity that's providing the service. They're the ones being paid for a good or something that they're doing here. Here you're seeing a basic Bitcore channel, Bitcore consumer constructor. Uh, you provide it with a public key, a refund address where the uh, unspent components of that channel will be sent, uh, and then the provider's address, which you'll have to exchange out of band. Um, there's some really cool things you can do with the uh, HTTP headers that uh, say, you know, I think it's 406 payment required. Someone correct me if that's not the correct HTTP header. You can exchange a JSON object that initiates the construction of this channel to the server. You'll create a new consumer, maybe in a browser extension, maybe in a, um, a, an actual local client application that will connect to the network. Uh, here we're specifying testnet. We're providing the parameters that we provided above. And we'll go ahead and process the funding. You have to fund these channels. It needs a UTXO that will feed into this uh, payment channel to prove that you have the amount of money that is the maximum value by that payment channel allowed. Uh, you'll also need to call setup refund, which allows the, uh, the provider, which I'll show you here in a moment, uh, to provide a refund transaction. So this is what a provider looks like. Um, you have a payment address. This is where the actual payment that the consumer is making, starting at a zero value and working its way up to uh, the maximum potential value of the contract is provided. Um, and you simply provide that. That's the only thing you need in the construction. There are some additional steps, such as setting up the refund transactions that are necessary. Um, so you'll need to get the, the, the public key. You'll need to use that public key to sign the refund transaction that was handed to you by that consumer. right? And then you'll need to always verify, right? trust but verify. Um, verify that all of these uh, inputs are actually correct. Uh, we're using the assertion method here. And then we're actually providing send to provider uh, on the client consumer side where we increment that payment. So if I download, say we're charging um, you know, a Satoshi per byte of transaction data, this is where we would increment that on the consumer side. The server would also increment that and verify that they have an equivalent transaction and that they're in agreement. Once the payment channel is closed, my browsing session is complete, my internet session is complete, my pump of gas is completely, my tank of gas is filled, uh, that payment channel closes uh, using the uh, get payment transaction method, which will wrap up and sign the, the finalized transaction, which you can then use the peer-to-peer -peer network to broadcast. So there's a lot of other interesting things that we can do. Um, we, we can put data in the blockchain, right? Um, in this case, this is a, a very simple construction of an op return based data storage mechanism. There is many other ways of doing this, but this is perhaps the most common one today. Uh, again, we're going to be familiar with the unspent output. Uh, we'll provide the, the known values, which we've probably received from our copy of the blockchain or the peer network. Um, We'll go ahead and take a private key that we're going to use to embed this data. In this case, we're just pulling in a WIF formatted version. Um, and then we're going to create a new transaction from that untrans un unspent transaction output, provide a fee, because otherwise the miners are very unlikely to, to actually mine it. Uh, and then all we have to do is call the dot add data function, and that will embed the corresponding data into the blockchain. Now, as of the latest versions, as of 0.11, if you provide more than 40 bytes of data in this field, I believe it breaks it up automatically for you into multiple transactions. Don't quote me on that, read the docs. Uh, but it's really powerful in this capacity. 
You then sign that, and then you can serialize, and you have a totally valid transaction that can be broadcast on the network, and it will subsequently be mined, right? Multi-sig, also something that's really exciting today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, new transaction, we want two public keys in this case, Alice pub key, Bob pub key. Unspent transaction output, so we can fund this multi-sig address. We're going to specify the from and the fee in this case. Same thing as before, very familiar. We're going to add an output, but we're going to use a special output constructor that's also provided by Bitcore. In this case, it has a method called build multi-sig out, which accepts an array right, of public keys that must match this, and this will construct the script for you. And as a second parameter, it, it says the number of required signatures to pass that script as true, right? And in this case, it's a one of two multi-sig address. Um, fairly, a fairly simple example. You sign that with the input's private key and serialize it, and it's a totally valid multi-sig transaction. That, in its entirety, is all you need to construct a multi-sig transaction. That's really powerful, especially when you start to look, take a look at things like copay, which I'll talk about in a moment. So some of the other plugins that we've got um, are the payment protocol plugin. Uh, this is a list of all of the plugins, their versions, and our coverage, which again, we're really big on code coverage. Payment protocol allows you to actually fully verify an X509 certificate in the browser, right? completely in JavaScript, totally valid. We've run the tests and everything, which means that all of these web wallets out there that don't support payment protocol today have no excuse for not doing so because it's a single module to do this now. P2P, which I showed you earlier how to connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network. Mnemonics, which allow you to construct uh, addresses that can be memorized more easily. Uh, uh, I believe that's ECIES, which is the message and key exchange protocol. Um, channel, which is the channel stuff that I showed you. Explorers, which is something I'd really like to talk about a little bit more in depth. But if you remember Insight, which is our blockchain explorer that we sort of rolled on our own, Explorers is now a more abstract framework for anyone in this room to go write their own blockchain explorer with its own behaviors, its own performance, its own database structure, and plug it into the Bitcoin infrastructure. And this is really important because all of the other tools, all the other plugins will just look for this abstract method, right? So when you want to say, get a, find a UTXO for a specific address or a specific balance, doesn't matter which Explorer plugin you use, you simply request that and it will find that from your application provided you've implemented that method. And furthermore, message, uh, which is a base class for simply the actual peer-to-peer -peer transaction messages that are broadcast on the peer-to-peer -peer network. So what did we build with this? I, I hope that most of you are familiar with Copay at this point. Um, it is our consumer-facing multi-signature wallet. Uh, we've placed a very big focus on user experience around this, and it's taken us a while to get there. We're developing this also completely open source. Our objectives are to make it so that it is very easy to run your own open source system, secure system, or even provide a service for others to do so. We want many other services out there providing this, right? We want to see the, the ecosystem grow, and that's why we made the decision to open source, the, open source this. Call it the wallet for everyone, not just consumers, not just businesses, but because it offers a lot of this complex functionality in a very simple interface, and it's easy to manage. That was very important for us. Copay.io if you haven't checked it out. Um, I was going to show a demo of what that looks like, but I think I'm going to dive a little bit more into the technicals instead. Um, and I'm going to talk about something that we just announced last week, uh, which is that all of the Copay functionality is now isolated as Bitcore modules as well. Um, this is our first big effort to basically take all of the work that we've done in Copay and isolate and modularize that so you can bake it into your services in a much easier fashion. Um, the one that's perhaps most important here is Bitcore-Wallet-Service, uh, which allows you to store uh, Copay transaction proposals. So say you're in a two of three multi-sig uh, uh, wallet at this point, you've got funds in that, and you need to quickly open your phone, propose a spend, close your phone, maybe you're going to lose network connectivity. But you shouldn't have to require that all of your peers for that wallet are online at the same time. Without some external solution, there's no multi, you know, Bitcoin itself doesn't offer that. So we baked that into Bitcore at this point. We baked it into Copay and Insight previously, but now we've ripped it out and called it Wallet Service, and it's a Bitcore plugin. It will store completely only the hash 
uh, of the transaction proposal so that it can be requeried later when you rejoin the wallet at a point when you were offline previously and you didn't see the initial broadcast. BitCore Wallet Client is the exact opposite side of things. It's the actual client that will connect to a wallet service, will download the outstanding transaction proposals, updated wallet details, any new transactions from the BitCore Wallet service. And then BitCore Wallet is a simple command line utility uh, to simply execute these things at your command line. You can literally in one line of code, or one, one command, wallet, create the name of the wallet, the, and then the number of multi-signatures you want, you'll get a secret just like you do in the actual user experience focused version of Copay. And anyone also running the same protocol can join that wallet. This can be, let's say someone creates a complete alternative version of Copay, it's not even Copay, but as long as it speaks the same protocol, they can connect to a BitCore wallet service server and connect to that wallet. So this allows, for the first time, cross-service compatibility with multi-sig wallets, which is really exciting. Um, so some things up next. Um, some of you might have seen Stevens talk about Foxtrot, which is our, our goal is to ultimately have a replacement for TCP IP. That's our long-term goal. Today it's an end-to-end encryp encryption network. It's a routing network that you can be sure of that no part, no nodes along the, from point A to point B to its, from the source to the destination can inspect that traffic. Uh, we're gonna basically bake that into BitCore and Copay uh, such that you can actually begin to transmit messages safely without having any fear of any uh, net neutrality debates or NSA type actors sort of preventing you or, or uh, spying on you. Error gapping, uh, we just, just this last week started a project where we wanna get, um, you know, make it so that a BitCore wallet service can provide an air gap functionality. It can provide an unsigned, or excuse me, it can take in an unsigned transaction, sign it, you can then pull that unsigned, si pull that signed transaction out and broadcast it at a later point in time. Um, decentralized identity management. So did anybody watch the MIT stream for the MIT Bitcoin Expo yesterday or Saturday? Excellent. Uh, so we, we talked about something called ChainDB. Uh, and if, if we didn't, if you haven't seen it, and you haven't seen it, uh, what we're doing with that, I encourage you to go watch the stream from yesterday. It's about halfway through. We talk about a mechanism. Uh, it's like a side chain, except there's no additional proof of work necessary. We use something new called proof of fees to, uh, for every Bitcoin block and every uh, chain DB block, it simply provides an op, op true to say anyone can spend this fee and then the miners uh, will basically pull in that, that signed block and will peg that block in a one-for-one -one relationship uh, with the ChainDB transaction. Now, this is, this is uh, it, we have not open sourced this yet, um, but we're excited to talk about it because for the first time, we think, uh, we don't have to solve the additional proof of work problem. Um, in fact, when a miner mines that transaction, it becomes a valid transaction. Uh, it invalidates any other potential bids, uh, which is really cool because then you can have a completely untrusted set of nodes. Whoever is willing to pay the most for the, for the pegging of that new block in the ChainDB, in the ChainDB database uh, will actually become the valid chain, which means a couple of interesting things. It means you can effectively rewind the chain if you need to, but spend much more. And that's what proof of fee is, is it sums weighting everything towards the oldest fees that have been spent in the ChainDB blocks, uh, sums them, and that's how it does block height resolution. So if you have two chains of equal height, which chain has spent in sum, weighted towards the older blocks, uh, to get them embedded in the Bitcoin blockchain. So in, the, in an event where, let's say, you've been compromised, and you do need the ability to rewind and roll back, you can expend a certain amount of Bitcoin to create a new fork in the chain, right? This is an interest, interesting construct which we're still playing with internally. Uh, and when we're ready, we'll, we'll sort of, we'll provide that when we feel that it's in a capacity that uh, everyone can use and that it's secure, we'll provide that. We'll be using that more than likely for things like decentralized identity management. What if no one had to have uh, the, uh, the, the, the trust necessary to host someone's wallet for you? What if you could provide backups into a decentralized network in a secure way where no one was liable for, for the compromise or breaking of that system because it simply wasn't possible, right? That's where we're looking to do with Copay is build a decentralized network of storage and a decentralized network that doesn't have any single point of failure. 
CoinJoin, this has recently come up on our GitHub issues list. Uh, some, if one of you would like to implement it, we would welcome a pull request. Uh, this is the beauty of open source. We think that this might be a, a big win for the community. Uh, Dark Wallet has also implemented something similar. Um, but we think this is going to be very powerful. So that's pretty much what I've got for the night. I, I really would like to welcome questions. Um, anything that you guys got, um, I'm happy to answer. So thank you. Brian. So on the chain DB, um, that was the first time I had actually heard of that. So I was trying to understand it when you were saying it. So if you have the, um, the sum of the fees and you want to kind of like think for if you can sort of pay more fees to change it. Yep. Does it get into like a, an arms race or something where the attacker or someone who compromised it could spend even more fees and all that? Absolutely, it does. Um, so you have to be willing to spend more to, to basically build the bigger chain. Right? And it gets more and more difficult as the chain becomes longer because it's weighted towards the older blocks. Mm -hmm. You can also, because ChainDB is an abstract, abstract database construction, you construct your own transaction rules. Mm -hmm. If you come under attack and you're not willing to spend to, to do that arms race, right? which we think is actually a good thing. It means that the economic actors who are provided, who have the most capital, can actually use the chain that they want to use. Right? You can actually discard transactions from specific actors if you want to. Right? Because it's totally open transaction rules, and whatever you're in consensus with, you're on a fork, right? Yeah. So in the same way that the Bitcoin network would defend against some such attack with like a miner, for example, having too much hashing power, you can simply snip off that, that uh, net of network of nodes even at the, the block hash level and not allow it into your version of your fork of ChainDB. This is really useful for uh, internal company processes where this might not be a totally open node, a totally open chain DB. This might be specific to your organization. You might run it on five servers at your organization. So, okay. cool. Can the miners get the fees that are spent to purchase mm -hmm. the chain? So actually, anyone gets the fees. Uh, only one valid uh, chain DB block per <laughs> Bitcoin block. Uh, and it's not a val and it invalidates automatically any other bidding transactions to embed a different version of that block. So it's an op true or op one, uh, which means anyone can anyone can take that. But in general, it'll be the miners that will take those fees, right? We're, the Bitcoin network is not even aware of this type of thing right now. We're still running it on testnet, uh, so it will be entirely dependent on when we actually make this available. We may not even use op true. We may use something else instead. Uh, so, okay, so upgrading from the older Bitcore to the newer Bitcore, the old transaction builder was actually a big pain point for us. Uh, it was kind of awkward to use, uh, kind of inconvenient. So what we did is we, we stepped back and took a brand new look at this. And we, we, there's, there's really no joining of the old transaction builder and the new transaction builder. So what we tried to do is make the new transaction constructor, is what we'll call it, uh, much more easy to use. So when you, re when you write something new that would replace some old Bitcore code, it's actually going to end up much cleaner. So there's, there's no linkage between transaction builder and the new transaction class in Bitcore. And is the new transaction class derived from the old transaction class? Or is it this, is a, this is a ground up rewrite, so it is completely different. And there is no old transaction class that can get me. No, there is not. You, you can still remain on the older Bitcoin or Bitcore 0.1 uh, line of line of code, um, but we're really pushing everyone towards 0.8 plus. Cur again, current version is 0.11. So, thanks. Can you talk a little more about the, um, the multi-sig uh, wallet working together? Like why you said, sort of if they were using Bitcore, it would sort of work. But what, what would it take in a practical sense for uh, you know, other multi-sig wallet providers will pay to all kind of work together and run it. So it, there, there's a basic protocol. Um, you basically identify your own mailbox based for your, your public keys as a hash. And you basically will ask the Bitcoin wallets, Bitcore wallet service, hey, do you have any new messages for me? It's a pretty pretty open protocol, right? You'll, you'll basically be able to look at that, that, uh, that message and if it's over Foxtrot, only you can decrypt it with your private key, 
right? And those messages will be delivered for you and then you can choose what you wanna do with them after the fact. Um, so really it's just like a mailbox service uh, as it stores the transaction proposals, so it identifies them based on the hash of their intended destination. Once whatever wallet you may build wants to connect, all you have to do is hash, hash that. You don't even have to use Bitcore. Connect to the port. It will send you messages intended for you, and then you can do handle it however you'd like. You could do that in Ruby or Java or Go. It doesn't matter. Ryan. So um, you've probably heard about this issue about the double spending, and some miners might kind of accept the higher fee transactions. Um, right. And you know we've been trying to think about how to solve this too. I, and I saw you guys publish something on it. Um, so I was curious if you had any thoughts on that, about like your favorite kind of solution going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we published something called Impulse, uh, impulse.is, uh, which basically attempts to solve uh, zero confirmation payments, right? You can identify whether or not a payment is valid without ever having to get it signed into a block. Now, it's an incomplete solution. It still requires some trust. So we're not entirely happy with it. But there's been a couple of other additional proposals. One of which is very interesting to us is the Lightning Network. Uh, recently was, was talked about here at the uh, Bitcoin Developer Meetup. It's, it's a little bit costly. Uh, the transactions are large and expensive. Um, and it has some unknown implications. I think we're a little early for seeing a rollout of those things, especially like when you see how slowly uh, payment protocol has been adopted for the, for the least case, right? And that's an easy, low-hanging thing, right? Um, I think we really have to sit down and think through these different options. There was actually a guy, I think he was at the Amsterdam Bitcoin Hackathon, who took our impulse, looked at that single uh, third, the, the trusted part, and found a way around that. And we're working on incorporating that into impulse today, but I honestly think it's a little too early to really find a payment channel solution unless it's a collaboration between, say, BitPay or Coinbase and a number of other larger uh, providers. It has to be adopted widely, otherwise it's going to be largely useless. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody want to share what they're building right now? I know FIVA here has got has got some done some awesome stuff with Bitcoin. You guys are building your uh, FIVA wallet. Yeah, so we're uh, right now we're building an enterprise solution, um, and uh, I'll let you guys know uh, we are going to be the enterprise solution of BitPay and Coinbase at some point. Um, <laughs> because at Coinbase, those guys don't want everyone to look at their wallets. I mean, everybody at Coinbase has Ryan's wallet, um, and they can look at his balance, right? Um, so he's going to use our service, right? Um, <laughs> to make sure that he keeps his own personal stuff off. But um, as far as enterprise go, we, we're thinking about things as far as uh, supply chains um, and being able to pay uh, people within supply chains. So you guys will see that really soon. We'll have a beta out probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's it. And we love, we love using Bitcoin. The reason why we use Bitcoin is because uh, we used to use Bitcoin JS. Talk to a lot of the devs on Bitcoin JS, they all got jobs. So, um, <laughs> they all have jobs now, so um, the big issue with that is they're not really doing anything with maintenance. Um, and we know that BitPay at least is like paying people, they gave people jobs to work on Bitcoin, so that's why we use Bitcoin. So. Um, if you have any further questions, pretty much everything we do is open source, github.com slash BitPay. Uh, you'll see a large list, including all of our plugins, <laughs> all of our integrations, everything. Tarek. Can you talk a little bit about BitPay Labs? Sure. So uh, BitPay Labs is sort of our discussion forum uh, and also our more research and design type part of the organization. Uh, we recognize that, okay, the reason we drop payment processing to zero is because pay Bitcoin disintermediates payment processing entirely, right? There will be a future at some point where... Bitcoin or cryptocurrency at large makes it very trivial to accept Bitcoin completely on your own and have a full array of services provided to you completely via a decentralized network. That point is in the future, right? We wanted to just go ahead and jump that gun and drop the rates to zero. And BitPay Labs is our, our place where we are looking at what is a future, a post-fiat future look like and what are the things that companies, individuals will need in that post-fiat future. 
So if you go to, uh, I believe it's labs.bitpay.com, we have a large set of discussion forums, including for our merchant services, including for our open source tools. Uh, people can share, you can share your projects, you can ask questions. Our engineers are very responsive. They will uh, gladly help you out with whatever it is that you're working on. Um, bit, that's labs.bitpay.com, and we're really excited to help anyone who wants to, to build stuff. Like, the future is entirely dependent on engineers and entrepreneurs to go out and build the infrastructure. It cannot be dependent on any one company or any small group of companies. There has to be many services and there has to be many options. So it's dependent entirely on all of us. All right, that's all I got, guys. <laughs>